Thanks, Steve and, and Brian and, and Tony and other, those for uh, inviting me to come speak with you today. Good afternoon. So my, my job is primarily focused on beef cattle nutrition and management. And uh, we do a lot of research, have graduate students here that are wanting to learn today, so they got to skip class. Um, and they're going to tour tomorrow, I think. Um, and we do a lot of work to try and improve what we think we know about beef cattle and how to feed them and how to manage them. My job is pretty focused in the feedlot space, but today I am going to talk a little bit about feedlot cattle and a little bit about cow-calf because I understand that, that there's a mix of maybe interests or goals here on confining them and what does that do ultimately then to, to the nutrition and management side. Um, and hopefully tonight, I know that we have multiple states represented, so tonight the steaks are going to be shaped just like that, I think, right? Uh, whatever's for dinner. Um, okay, so, you know, nutrition's uh, probably something that if you have a current beef operation, you may get advice from. You may get advice from your, your local cooperative or feed sales. You may have a consultant if you're finishing cattle. Uh, either way, you might be getting some advice, and that's, that's just fine. And I'm not necessarily replacing that, although my job is to help them give you good and accurate advice too. Um, but nutrition's not terribly complicated. It's implementing it at your level and at the farm level and managing that process. Start with, you know, I think energy drives the, the bus, so to speak, and the rest, we just gotta make sure we've adequately met those requirements. Ultimately, it's the decisions you make on grain, how much grain, for, uh, forage qualities, if you're, if you're talking about cows or, or backgrounding cattle, byproducts and which byproducts you're gonna use and what those energy contents are. But energy's sort of uh, key first. That'll dictate for finishing cattle, what's your possible optimum or maximum gain from that diet. Now, if you're short on protein, if you're short on some mineral or probably won't even see this, but if you're short on a vitamin, that can minimize your potential, right? But the potential set based on energy. Most producers are going to be purchasing in protein and, and probably getting some protein from different byproducts. Today, obviously, that's heavily distiller's grains, uh, gluten feed, those types. Certainly, your supplemental minerals, your supplemental vitamins are going to come in from a supplement of some sort in general cases. And then you may decide, I'm going to feed some feed additives like uh, ion fours or other uh, feed additives. Those could come from the supplement, or you can put them in if you're a larger feeder directly from a micro, micro machine. And those are different whether we're talking finishing cattle, cows, backgrounding calves, and so on. So if there's questions about those, you know, happy to talk about them. I'm going to delve into really two applications, and that is finishing cattle, first and then a little bit on the cow side and, and cow-calf applications, especially in confinement systems. Um, one of the things, obviously, terminology, if I say calf feds, those are going to be longer day fed calves coming in, lighter, 600 pound weights, whatever. Uh, we can still have calf feds heavier than that. You can obviously have calf, calf feds lighter than that. So I put those weights on there. There's nothing magical about that definition, but we're going to feed them quite a long time. Obviously, we can buy yearlings, seven, eight, nine weights. Uh, the bigger they get, the generally, the longer the yearling is, meaning they've been raised for a longer period of time, or they were pushed faster to, during backgrounding. And then you can have uh, a big, long yearlings coming off pasture, 900 plus pounds. And every time, the bigger, the bigger we get going in, theoretically, the bigger they go out, and that's really what you're managing in the finishing system. When it comes back to when we talk about some confinement system, whether that's deep bedded barns or slatted floors, uh, number of days that they're in those facilities can influence that, especially on the slatted floors. I won't spend time on backgrounding cattle, although we can talk about it, but I don't see that generally as a common question or approach when we have a, a complete confined barn system, really is what I'm talking about. You know, we, we can dry lot background calves a lot, but generally, most at least most of the applications I see are, are open lots in those situations. And then, uh, more and more interest in the cow side, 
And really, um, that's not my forte, although I stole some slides uh, today even on, on this area and uh, understand it and been involved in some of the things we've tried, which I'll share with you. But really, I, you can classify those cows into two, two systems, and it's really important which one are they doing. Either they're lactating with the calf on them, or they're, they're dry and, and presumably gestating at that time. Okay, so uh, about a year ago, there was a consultant, his name is Dr. Eric Lowe, who presented at a, at a professional meeting, which I attended and was listening to him. And I thought he had some good points. He has uh, actually more diverse experiences than I do because he's visited a numerous operations or has clients with lots of different barns. So I'm gonna go through some key points he made and, and, and sprinkle in some, some other things and then offer at the end of that some of more my perspective on what he said. So I just wanna make sure it's clear. It's not that I don't agree with these, but I also wanna give credit to, to, uh, to Eric Lowe. Okay, so to start with, um, there is a benefit of having these, uh, when we have these feeding systems that are under roof, to have the feed under roof too, okay? Now today's not an issue, but we've had a lot of moisture in this part, and uh, all that snow and water, if it's under the roof, the bunks are under the roof, then that's a plus. So having the, the feed covered, now, Eric said fresher. I'm not sure that that's the case, right? It can spoil just as readily under the under roof as it can outside, but that is a consideration to keep it out of, out of precipitation. Generally, his experience was that cattle go in for a part of the finishing period, maybe targeting less than 150 days. What that automatically tells me, especially a consideration for you to have in mind, is that you may still need some open lots or, or cattle holding areas in other words, I think it's very rare to have a complete uh, barn system, cattle all in, all out, only in that system. That's, that's the experience, generally speaking. So cattle may be started outside and go in at the end or for the last phase, generally targeting less than 150 days. They also can be strategic, okay? So if you're receiving stressed calves, whether it's inclement, whatever, inclement weather, you can, can target those calves going in at that time. Now, I classify these generally into two systems. One, less labor and breading was his comment, which is obviously referring to the slatted floor facility, or more labor and bedding, which would be the deep bedded barn system. But obviously there's a cost difference in that initial construction, which obviously will, will likely come up and be discussed, uh, and certainly can ask central confinement folks about that. So my point is that you got a bit of a trade-off between a little higher cost of initial investment, less challenge or maintenance for, for labor and upkeep on a weekly basis in the slide of the floor, or a little lower cost initially, more input over time. Now, his comment and my comment too, and especially when we first talked about this with Tony and, and Steve and them, is that when it comes down to finishing cattle, the nutrition is really not dramatically different. So there's not something we would do differently. In, I, I got a couple of examples, but the energy that you're gonna buy, whether you're gonna, how much corn you're gonna feed, how much byproducts, generally react the same whether you're in a barn system or an open lot system. I can't think of many examples where it would behave differently in a barn versus outside pens. There are a couple exceptions, uh, which I will, which I will uh, allude to here as we go. Obviously, there is a major perception in some reality of during bad weather, the cattle inside the barns are certainly gonna be doing better. Um, and I say that's perception because that's just obvious, right? Everybody says that. But the weather's not always bad, and actually during really nice weather, cattle do a little better outside. So it's a bit of a trade-off, and when we measure cattle over a whole feeding period, there's bad days and good days in that feeding period, right? And so I think it's important to look at a couple, at a couple of the data that are out there, which is what I'm gonna to shift to. This is actually from South Dakota State, and I wanted to show these data for two reasons. One is so you're aware that there are some data out there in side-by-side -side comparisons. Number, that's the most important thing, so you can go find it if you want, or I can give, give it to anybody that requests it. The second thing is, is that my perception is, generally speaking, uh, in some of our covered barns, cattle tend to eat a little less, tend to gain a little less than their outside counterparts, and the efficiencies are the same or at times a little better. 
Now that depends. If it's a heat stress event and it's really hot out, today we're experiencing some heat stress in our outdoor pens. Maybe not with this wind, but the temperature is certainly high enough coming out of winter, we would heat, see heat stress today in cattle. It sounds kind of funny, right? Cattle inside a barn are not experiencing heat stress. So my so during heat stress, cattle and barns can continue to eat more. I'm going to come back to that though because it does catch up to it. This is the South Dakota State data, a uh, nice uh, 28 uh, lot comparison presented by Robbie Pritchard a number of years ago. I don't know if there's a more recent update. I have not seen it. Maybe there is and somebody's aware of it. They compared cattle in open pens, open with a little shelter, and then a deep bedded barn. Conversion to seven, six, eight, six, seven. Um, and that's, you know, in this part of the country. Intakes, which is what surprised me, were the same across those systems. That's the part I thought would be impacted and uh, really wasn't. So how did they get a little more better conversions? They gained a little better. And that's probably because of those bad days, they were doing even better inside. Iowa State has some data that's from Southwest Iowa here, not as large as number of, of data sets, but it's still a, a data set to look at. They had a hoop barn, again, a deep bedded uh, barn and uh, open lots. And I, I want to point out that if you read these studies, sometimes you see people present live weights out and then carcass weights out. I would strongly encourage you to pay attention to the carcass weights out more so than the live weights out. And especially comparing different housing systems because we've sent some muddy cattle to slaughter in the last month. Does that make sense to everybody? And mud is not what you were selling to the packer. At least you won't twice. You follow me? So even if you're, many of you might say, well, no, I saw my cattle live. I just worried about what they were live. Trust me, you're selling cattle on a parkway basis, whether you know it or not. Because the next time you get offered some pay, it'll be at a lower amount because of your tag that you sent them the last time. Is that, it's going to even out eventually. You're selling carcass weight whether you know it or not. You just don't know what your carcass weight is if you don't price them that way. So, again, I was a bit surprised by the intakes. In this case, the live weights were, were heavier, but that's all almost all tag. If you read that study, the carcass weights were a little heavier, which is what shows up here in this carcass-adjusted average daily gain. Conversion's a little better, but those are in the open lots, not in the uh, in the uh, in the in the hoop barn. And then this is a little this is another set of study on deep bedded barns. This one's a little different because this is a whole bunch of private commercial operations, um, not a controlled research study. But there's a lot of cattle in it. Okay, so you got to be a little careful here because when you start comparing across everybody's different operation, you're not comparing apples to apples anymore. But if you have a million of them, then you're, you're, you're probably pretty safe in that. You understand? So the more you get in that comparison, the better the comparison is. But it is a little risky. So this is a study published a number of years ago. I apologize because it's in the journal. It's a metric. My main thing is I expected an intake difference between the open lots and the, and the bedded barns. Did not see that. Uh, bedded barns a little bit better in terms of uh, gain and in this case feed efficiency so conversions would have been a little better. So all that evidence is is that at least in two of those performance is at least as good in a couple cases better and unlike what I thought it's not intake it's it's actually some better gain. Okay the, the bedding um, Eric's take from his clients was the bedded barns require management. If you don't, if you don't want to manage it, then that's probably not a system for you. And uh, that means probably on a weekly basis, both bedding them out and being very judicial in your, in your upkeep and management. If you do go to slatted floors, now your diet characteristics do influence both the manure quality in the pit and the manure characteristics for pumping and so on, as well as um, uh, he was worried about how slippery the, the slats are and cow movement. I think it's fair because I've seen that in numerous cases and he brought this up too, that bunk space is tighter <coughs> in complete confinement uh, barn facilities. We might be targeting five or six inches of bunk space versus probably 10 to 12 inches of bunk space in open lots. 
So back to that previous study where there was a whole bunch of producers' data in, in deep bedded barns and a whole bunch of producers' data in open lots. Those are, again, that's one of the apples and oranges parts, right, if they're not the same bunk space. I don't know what the implications of that are. It's not been tested. It'd be nice to know. But if you are going to crowd them down to a little less bunk space for finishing cattle now, we'll come back to bunk space for cows, for finishing cattle, if you're going to crowd them down some, now sorting and, and, and how cattle consume a consistent diet across time is really important. If cattle come up and can, can eat first, and the others come up because they can't fit in and eat second or third, if there's been sorting, the ones eating later are getting a different diet, you know, potentially than what you target. That could be more grain, could be less grain. Either one could have a problem. And then particle size, because that sorting might be more important in these confinement systems. Most times his experience was cattle kind of started outside. I, I think that's an interesting question and observation. So do you have to design in some open lot facilities for, for bringing cattle in? Uh, intake is probably what you would measure on a daily basis to know how things are going. If cattle aren't eating well, you've got a problem. You may not know what the problem is, but you've got a problem. So in finishing situations, intake is monitored daily. It's what your best assessment is of how cattle are doing. Um, but in general, cattle are going to be stepped up the same way. You know, we got to adapt cattle over to high grain diets, to over to your finishing diet, over a four step or whatever process across the 21 to 28 days. That process is going to be the same essentially if you're stepping them up in a barn versus outside. Now, one comment, and, and Eric had data on this, is that um, heat stress events can be a little bit of a delayed reaction. What his scenario was is let's use today as an example. Pretend it's July and hot out, okay? It's our first hot spell. Cattle and outside pens will likely cut back intake today. Their experience is that in a day or two, the cattle inside barns will sort of catch up to them and start dropping intake. So it's just a delayed response and it won't be as severe of a drop. The other issue though is that there could be some heat retention depending upon airflow, so they may not recover as fast. I think some of that's probably dependent upon design and, and how well those new barns do to where that reaction may not be delayed and may not last longer than the open lots. So I don't think heat stress events eliminate drops in intake. Probably not as severe if the heat stress events are less in the barn, and that's certainly a common observation. The other thing, which will be good to, to learn about tomorrow in the health discussion, common observation, you're going to have more lameness challenges in, in confinement barns for finishing cattle. So watching lameness, you don't want to contribute to that problem. One way to contribute to that problem that you're in control of is acidosis. One of the responses for acidosis, so if cattle overeat on grain, causes lameness issues, causes laminitis, that's just exasperated more if cattle are in barns and it can be a challenge. So how do we manage that? How you manage your roughage or the forage that you're feeding in those systems, how long you feed cattle in that system can manage that. And then there is some opportunity for interaction with zinc and other micro minerals. So your micro mineral program is pretty crucial in these confined barn systems. So research questions. And now after this slide is back to me, but I, I so far I've, I've, if I've disagreed or thought it was not quite right with what our experience has been, then I commented. But according to Eric, there's probably more work that needs to be done on this on this roughage issue and should we be feeding cattle differently from an acidosis standpoint in barns or not. That's not been well researched according to him and I would agree with that. This bunk space question I brought up, right? If we crowd calves more or cattle more in into confinement versus outdoor pens, what does that mean? And, and we probably need to do work on that. Number of feedings and timing of those feed deliveries was a comment he made. And then I agree with this, and there's been other consultants who've talked about this, is that do cattle react differently to, to feed additives or, or technologies that we would commonly use? If any of you are finishing cattle now, have an operation, you probably either have or are feeding uh, beta agonists like rectopamine or Zoptiflex. And um, it's been a common question is, do we get the same response in these systems? To that, to that uh, beta agonist feeding? That's a good question. It's not been addressed as far as I know. And then uh, uh, how do we manage the swift growth and, and wear and health issues, which again, I think I'll just punch to tomorrow. Okay, 
Now, I think that relative to open lots, manure quality is immensely better. The challenge with open lot manure is soil. And any of you who have open lots who are thinking right now, well, we do a good job, we manage the soil, uh, you're kidding yourself. I was going to use a stronger word, but I decided not to. You're kidding yourself. You have soil contamination, and, and if you don't eventually fix that, you're either not hauling out enough manure over time, and you're going to have muddy pens and a problem, or you're having to haul dirt back in to maintain the pen shape. There's just no other way around it in open lots. We have a major soil contamination in open lot manure, and it's unavoidable. Everybody does it. Just a question of severity. There isn't soil contamination in these confinement barn systems, so it, the manure quality is immensely better, and uh, certainly that nutrient value then is better for the manure when, when applied agronomically. Big issue, and probably will continue to be even a bigger issue in the future. I am, I'm amazed, um, any of you who have open lots and anybody in Eastern Nebraska can attest to this for the last two years, pen maintenance is a challenge, okay? We've had really challenging weather here in this part of the state for the last two and a half years. And most feed yards will spend 150 days of the year pen, maintaining pens or, or moving manure around, hauling it out and so on. Uh, we visited an operation, and I visited an operation in Minnesota, and was talking to the gentleman, and they had spent their the, the two days before that he'd spent his one day of the year on pen maintenance and manure management. That was the day they were pumping the barn. Does that make sense to everybody? So instead of spending 150 days, spent one day. That's a big issue, and that's a big big opportunity. What is that worth? Is is then the question, and something for you to be thinking about. So I think pen maintenance is, is, a, is a big issue and a big plus for these confinement barns, especially I would say the slab and floor barns where you can spend a fairly limited amount of time. And you can do that whether it's rain or shine, at least for moving manure. Um, I think this is a big issue. The, the trade-off you've got to really wrestle with is do I put in a slab and floor facility or a deep bedded barn? You know, that's there, there's trade-offs and I've tried to sort of outline those. I do think that there's performance benefits to these confinement barns. It obviously depends on what the season's like, and it's somewhat seasonal. And, and I think there's getting to be more and more data that shows that there's a, a benefit, albeit it's fairly small, but there is a benefit to performance. If you're in an area where runoff control isn't even a possibility, I grew up in Northeast Iowa, much more humid and wet climate. We probably can't build a pond big enough to manage the runoff. You see the problem? So, you don't have much choice if you're going to finish a lot of cattle there. Uh, whereas, as you get west from here, more arid climate, easier to manage that issue. Health comparisons, I think, is good to talk about tomorrow, but it's very difficult, in my opinion, to, to make these without side-by-side -side comparisons because I can buy a group of cattle that really are, are prone to get sick. I can buy another group of cattle that aren't. And if I run them through different systems, you, you'll make conclusions about the system instead of the cow. And then I think we got to really delve into any of these final questions on design, such as bump space and so on. So back to then the question, which I was challenged with, is what's going to change nutritionally? So if you're finishing cattle now and you want to put in a confinement facility, what really changes? Probably the considerations are anything to manage acidosis. So you might consider putting in more roughage than what you have before. Just remember, though, that if you don't need it for those finishing cattle, all you did was hurt conversion. So there's kind of a fine line you're trying to get to of what's the minimal amount of roughage I need to avoid acidosis and yet optimize my, my feed conversion. There are other ways to manage acidosis. And um, again, I know there's a diverse, everybody's from a diverse area, but you know it's just commonplace for us to feed some level of distiller's grains or gluten feed. Uh, in our diets, especially here. And those help with managing acidosis, especially gluten feed and, and or sweet bran from Cargill. Those are gonna help manage that process. I would see those products, this has not been tested, but I would think those products would have even more value in this type, in a, in a confinement barn situation. Roughage and feeding these byproducts will increase the manure amounts some. 
Trace mineral program probably needs to make sure you're, you're really styled on that and including um, uh, management of your zinc levels. And then, I don't know, maybe there's an issue with sorting and part size, although I don't think that's as big as number one and number two. Okay, uh, any, uh, obviously you can take questions now or later, but I'm gonna shift gears. Uh, if anybody's got a burning question on feedlot cattle, can talk about it now or you can wait. Um, but switching then maybe to the cow side, um, the, cow, the cow thing is, is interesting and I guess I'm making an assumption, which is maybe bad, because then you can prove me wrong here in a minute. I'm not aware of anybody running with interest or running a cow system with sliding floors, right? All of those that I'm aware of with confinement, uh, interest and questions for the cow-calf sector or deep bedded barns. Um, but again, I'm, I'm certainly delighted to know differently, but I've not been aware of anybody who's ever had a question or talked about that. So I'm making a bit of an assumption that when, when we're talking about cow calf issues and confinement barns, it's a deep bedded barn system. Your production goals are a little different in a cow calf system, okay? Number one goal should always be reproduction and the cows get bred. It's a big issue. Second issue then is obviously wean and calves live. And, and I would encourage anybody in the cow calf sector that one of your production metrics should be pounds of wean calf per cow exposed. Not per cow, per cow exposed. And I've, I've joked about this in less knowledgeable audiences that everybody know what exposed means, right? And, and of course, if you're not in the deep industry, then they have a question like, no, I don't know what exposed means. Try explaining that. But um, there's really then though no two systems that you need to think about with this cow. Again, when the cow is dry and presumably gestating, because she's gonna have a calf relatively soon, okay? Or she's had a calf and she's lactating, and then there's a lactation curve, and those requirements change over lactation. But we know those, okay? So when you can find this cow in this system, it is actually, I believe, easier. And the reason why is because we know the requirements, we think we know those pretty well, so we know what that cow needs. And now, in, our, in this cow system, we know what she's gonna get. To me, the hard part in many cow systems is that when you have an extensive grazing system with cows, you actually do not know exactly what she gets or exactly how much she gets. Is that clear to everybody? When they're in a grazing situation, it's actually hard to know how much is, are they eating and in some cases, what are they getting when they're grazing? Because they graze better than what's there, and we really don't know a lot about how well they eat in some grazing situations. It's hard to measure. So, the good thing about these systems is we control their nutrition completely, how much they're eating and what they're getting. Obviously, the challenge worth discussing is that if you're feeding her 100, the cow 100% harvested feed, in many cases, but not all, in many cases, that could be more expensive than grazing, um, depending upon what you're grazing and the cost of grass, which I'm going to come back to. Uh, okay, I've discussed that already, that really we're talking about uh, deep bedded barns. I'm not aware of a lot of comparisons where we have multiple cow herds. So these cow herds run through a deep bedded barn. These cow herds run through a grass and grazing system and make a comparison between the two. That's what I mean by a fair comparison. I'm not aware of data that are out there like say, okay, this is what they did for the last 10 years and this system was better than this one. That's not available for us to use, okay? We have looked at confining cows really on, on two different projects over the last 10 years, and, but they're, they're not confined in deep bedded bars. They're confined in dry lot, okay, which could be a little different. So I'm just saying that I'm going to show you a little bit of work here and talk about some of the issues we've seen with confining cows, but I want to be clear, everybody remember, when, we, when I use confined cows now, those were confined in a dry lot feedlot system, open lot, versus a grazing type system. We've done those comparisons, but we don't have the bedded barn added into it. Um, the first project we did was kind of a, 
just to see how they would do if we can find cows year round. So they were in our dry lot system year round, cows never left the pens. Unless we were giving shots or, or doing something to them, right? So every day they were in the feedlot pen, never grazed. Turns out that was a little expensive because we got to figure out how you're going to charge yardage and so on. And so then we went to a system of comparing that year round grazing or year round confinement, excuse me, to actually confining them just during the summer. Now, I, when I went to school or when I was growing up, however you want to look at this, your experience has been, I was always told grass is always cheaper. You graze grass in the summer and it's always cheaper. And if you got cows, you got to have them out on grass grazing. That's not the case in all situations and certainly not the case in all areas today. There are a lot of scenarios here in Nebraska anyway where I can show you more expensive production systems where the cows are out grazing grass in the summer than what I can feed them in the summer and pens. So we went to actually the opposite. We used to, when I was a kid, graze grass in the summer, dry a lot through the winter and feed them hay, right? Everybody, that's just the way you did it. This one's the opposite. We didn't feed them hay, but you feed them in the summer and then they graze all winter. And so I want to show you a little bit about that uh, because it was actually an interesting way. So that's the other thing I would say. The other comment that I have heard of people doing with deep bedded barn systems and cows is they run multiple cow systems through it and then the rest for part of the year they might calve in those barns, they may have some dry cows in those barns, but then they're grazing other parts of the year and to keep that barn full they might have fall calving curve and spring calving Cutting kind of herd. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're keeping your barns full and utilizing when you want to, but with actually two different calving times and two cow systems. Okay, to start with, I want to, I want to, I guess, uh, address a couple of issues related to the cow side. One is everybody knows if you're early wean, that's good for the for the efficiency of the system, right? Everybody has anybody heard that or you know think about that? When we have drought. What do you do? Early wean to save the forage. Um, well, we're not on a pasture, so drought doesn't influence whether we have to feed them today. So we want to ask the question now in a confinement system is, if I pull that calf off of that cow early, like at 90 days of age, or 100 days of age, and I put the calf in a separate pen and feed the calf and the cow separately, so now I got a dry cow, I got the calf that I got to feed separately, versus keep them together, right? Which system's more efficient? Now, what we did, and uh, when I say we, I wasn't in charge of this. It was actually a colleague of mine who was only a little bit involved. What we did that's different than all of the other work out there is that the calves and the cows got the same diet. So what you, what you would see with all of the early weaning work is that they say the calves are better off being separated from the mom and it makes the whole system better. Well, what they did is they kept the cow on a pasture many times. It did save the grass because as soon as she's dry, she doesn't need as much forage. You take the calf out of the system and you give them a really high energy grain diet. I guarantee you, you give high energy grain diets to the calves, they'll do better than if you feed them a forage based pasture diet. Does that make sense to everybody? So we want to eliminate that problem. We gave the cows and the calves the same diet because we were going to feed a lot of the stiller's grains and some corn stalks or wheat straw, basically corn stalks and stiller's grains. So it's high energy, palatable, both the calves and the cows could do it. How did we make sure that we gave the same? Because we had the cows and the calves in pens and we were delivering their feed and we knew that if we had the cow and the calf together, we had to feed them 24 pounds of that diet to meet the cow's requirement and the calves to gain two pounds a day and do really well. We knew that. So how did we do this over here? We made sure that the cow who got weaned and the calf consumed the same amount as the cows and calves running together. Does that make sense to everybody? So same diet, same amount, but the cows and calves separated or the cows and calves together. Okay, so what happened? Uh, this is the early weed. This is the normal weed, 
early wean and normal wean, normal wean. This is at two locations. This one here is about um, 60 miles back to the east from here near Meade, Nebraska, at one of our research stations. This one here is uh, a long ways from us, uh, basically at the Panhandle Station in Nebraska next to the Wyoming border. We did it in both locations. We did it in both locations because every day is nice in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Okay? Not every day is nice in Columbus, Nebraska, or Meade, Nebraska. Does that make sense? So we want to see, was there an effect in the environment? Well, at the time, uh, the, these calves were basically a little under 300 pounds in both locations. And you can see the early wean calves actually were lighter than the normal wean calves at, at me, at NREC, and was the opposite actually out of the panhandle. I can't explain why. And the gains reflect that, okay? So 1.7 to 2, 1.9 to 1.7. So a little different based on location, and I don't know exactly why that happened, but on average, it's about the same. Now, we did calculate, what, what was interesting is that in this system, the cows were losing some body condition by milking it into the calf. In this case, the cows were gaining some condition because they weren't milking into the calf. Now, why that happens, the part I don't know. But either way, if you look at how much the cow energy was, it turned out to be very similar across all four systems. I think the most important thing for everybody to, to realize here today is that if you're debating putting a cow system into a deep bedded barn, and you want to do that, and you've worked out the economics, we know the nutrition that's required, okay? You can easily feed those cows to meet their requirements and get along just fine. You can raise body condition score. We can take some body condition score off of them. Okay. We can make sure, but we can do our best to maintain body condition score. But over time, through adjustments, it is fairly surprisingly easy to manage that cow system. But there's a lot of different ways to do that. Okay. So what we've chosen to do is instead of giving them unlimited quantities of grass hay, we've actually chosen to use some less expensive distiller's grains and less, certainly less expensive uh, corn stalks or wheat straw and actually increase the amount of energy in the diet but limit the cow. A cow needs about uh, 12 pounds of TDN when she's dry in, in mid the mid third the early last trimester trimester of gestation okay 12 pounds of tdn and if you don't know what tdn is you know it's just a measure, measure of energy if you send in your hay samples you should have a tdn come back on that hay sample so we know that's what she requires i can give her 12 pounds of tdn by giving her 15 pounds of a distiller's grains crop residue mix or i can give her 12 pounds of tdn by giving her 35 pounds of stalks. Now she's gonna have trouble eating 35 pounds of stalks. Everybody follow the math? But in both those cases, it delivers the same amount of TDN. That's what I mean by there's lots of ways to deliver 12 pounds of TDN. And that's what they require, and it's an amount per day. That's why I've been using 12 pounds. So I think it's obvious, right? You can feed a lower energy diet and give her more, or you can feed a higher energy diet if it's cheaper and, and limit her intake. Now, if we're talking about, here's where I get most interested to make sure I understand. If I build a deep bedded barn that's gonna hold 500 cows, and I plan that for one foot of bunk space, you've got a problem. The reason you've got a problem is because if you're gonna live and feed a cow, she needs 24 inches of bunk space, two foot. If you're gonna have cows with calves, our experience is you need to have three foot of bunk space, 36 inches. So that changes the dynamics, right? So I just want to make sure everybody's aware. If you're ad libitum, if you're ad libitum feeding them, um, in other words, if you're going to feed a lower energy diet like a hay diet, assuming it'll fit in the bunk, then limit, then then the bunk space is less of a concern. So I think this is a key issue: how much bunk space do you have? Can you limit a high energy diet, or do you got to feed her more with a low energy diet? Uh, these are the diets we fed. Doesn't mean they're right. Again, there's a hundred ways you could probably get to this. But for our system, distiller's grains, 
um, either modified or wet at the end rack or paint handle. And those diets are the same, except in one year we fed corn stalks at meat. We fed wheat straw the rest of the time. And you know what? It worked well and, and did quite well. This is in our 2018 Nebraska beef report. The challenge was um, not in the dry lot system. In the dry lot system, this is running cows from, um, forget the time, but it would be basically in the spring, oh, late winter, early springtime. These cows were gaining some weight, which they should likely be gaining some weight to maintain body condition score because they're gestating. Body condition scores were pretty high, 5.6, ended at 5.8. Our cows that were out grazing corn stalks through the winter, we were trying to cheapen up this, this dry lot system, so we put them out in the wintertime. We didn't do as good a job maintaining body condition score when we did that here at meat. Out at the panhandle, uh, they did about the same. The cows maintained body condition score really pretty well in both situations, but body condition scores were higher. They had better cows than what we did. So I'm just being open with you with the data say. You're welcome to go review that. How did the calves do? Calves that were kept in dry lot, weaned at uh, 630 pounds, uh, gained 2.35 per, per unit of calf age versus two pounds on the stalks, 2.25. My point of showing this is, is that again, if they're in dry lot, we can manage lactating and dry gestating cows and really target a two pound a day calf gains while the calves are in the cows, maintain body. My point is it's a known quantity. Okay, that's why I was mainly showing these is that we can get those targets by knowing what the requirements are. Now, in the last few years, we've been doing another cow comparison. And in this case, um, it's back to my comment before, we're, we're basically running two cow systems. One we call the traditional system, and that is they graze grass in the summer, they graze some corn stalks in the wintertime when they're dry, a little bit of dry lotting and hay feeding while they're calving, and then turn out the grass here in another month. Okay, that'd be a very traditional, typical system. And by the way, if you've got grass, then that works great. If you've got grass, you probably wouldn't be here thinking about putting in a cow confinement system though, right? So our question was, what can you do and that's if, if you've got, if you want to have cows or diversify your, your operation, but you're a cropping enterprise. So this is where we brought in the idea in the, in the alternate system, calving date has changed. Okay, this is the March calving system. This is an August calving system. And that's important because we wanted to dry lot those cows for most of the summer while they were dry and gestating. It's less expensive to feed a dry gestating cow than a lactating cow, cow with the calf on. So we calved in August, or are calving in August. Then they're grazing fall cover crops. Then we wean after they come off of a cover crop roughly January 1st or early January. Then we graze the dry cow on stalks. And then when we run out of stalks, she goes back into the dry lot feedlot system. So back to that system of not grazing in the summer, petting them up in the summer, graze all winter long, either with cover crop. And you know what? It's been working pretty well. You know what? Which one's more economical so far? So far, it's still the traditional system. So. I'm just, I'm, that's in the works. The student is working on that. This is the day that I was getting today. Uh, it's finishing up this spring. Okay, so this is just coming out now and I'm only a little bit small, but I want to bring it up as, a, as another system. Again, to illustrate that we can feed these cows in the summertime, I want to show you the diets and the intakes we use. So really the reason I'm showing these data is to show you how are we dry lotting those cows. Again, fed a lot of stillers grains, modified stillers, either uh, I think it's wheat straw and or corn stalks across the years at about 40 percent a little bit of supplement these cows are kept in our dry lot system for 220 days through the summertime during gestation we were feeding 14 to 15 pounds during lactation we're feeding 17 to 19 pounds of that diet now that doesn't mean that's the best diet for you depending upon what your cost of stillers grains are and stalks and supply and so on but it's an option I want to show you again, back to this, does it work and can you do it? This is the intakes across the two years of data that we have so far. Uh, year one is, is in orange and year two is in blue. So they come off of this stock grazing, 
We've stepped them down to this intake of about 14 pounds for most of the summer. They calve, and it's common sense, right? And once that cow calves, then she starts milking more, her requirements really go up. And so you've got to start delivering more and more feed. And then what we do here in October, that's when we kick them out on the fall cover crop. Okay, so that was the system, and the cows are doing just fine, and, and the students are working on the economics. One challenge about this is not all cows have a calf on the same day. Does everybody have that experience? Right? So the problem is when you've got a group of 100 cows, which is what we have in each of these systems, they're actually, or 80 cows, excuse me, they're maintained in four groups of 20. So we have the replicated, four independent groups of 20 head managed this way, four independent groups of 20 head managed in our traditional system. That's important for scientific purposes, but not all 20 of those cows calve in the same day. So the problem is if you're gonna manage this system, I would stage it so that when cows have a calf, if you can keep them together so that you keep cows consistent by a calf age. That will help you feed them even more accurately. Okay, if I just had those 80 cows and fed them for the average of when those 80 cows calve, that's gonna be a little hard because some of those cows will be lactating early and be underfed. Some of them will still be gestating and be overfed. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's very challenging at times to manage that to accurately feed I Okay, conclusions on the, on the cow-calf side. I think this nutrition part is known and actually works pretty well. There are some health risks of, of us that we've experienced with our dry lotting system. I'm assuming those health risks are the same if I had a deep bedded barn system. Um, a little bit more scours, which we managed. Now I put up there on the slide the Sand Hills calving system. I don't know if anybody's even, if you're not from Nebraska, maybe you certainly haven't heard of that. The Sand Hills calving system concept is um, one of our veterinarians, uh, Dave Smith, was working with a ranch, had a terrible scouring problem. And the Sand Hills calving system was what he learned is that the calves that were newborns getting scours were actually getting scours from the calves that were three weeks old, okay? So what they do, you move the cows that haven't calved yet out of the, uh, you, know, you, move, you move cows as they calve into new pens or new pastures and it eliminated the scour problem. That's the Sand Hills calving system. Okay, that sounds great and it works great. If you have 100 cows penned up, it's pretty hard at times to, to uh, mother up with the calf. Does that make sense? So you've got to move the right cow. That's a bit of a challenge. So it sounds good in practice. It's actually hard to, to put into practice here. Uh, sounds good, but it's hard to put in practice. We do notice there's probably quite a bit of stealing going on from, uh, from different calves on different cows. I think dry gestating cows, it's pretty easy. Keep it as cheap as possible. Make sure you meet the requirements and it works great. Lactation, you know, it's a little hard, but if you can stage those cows based on when they calve, then that's pretty good. Okay, uh, Steve, uh, there's about 10 minutes left. You had asked me to talk a little bit about, you know, what we've been thinking about doing, and we're going to be doing a lot more research stuff in the future and, and building some things in our own research station. We're going to do more research and do things differently. Um, so I can mention that, and then, but my guess is given the, if you were all Nebraskans, you'd probably be really excited about this. If you're from another state, you might not be as excited, although I think we'll benefit all of you when we build this. So we're looking at putting in a new system um, and, and really trying to look at more ways of producing beef in sustainable ways. We are gonna to continue to look at the product that's coming out of those systems. We have historically here in Nebraska not had a focus on as much on health and well-being. We're gonna change that. We've hired three new veterinarians in our system. And then I think we're gonna to continue to try and do a good job of, of uh, getting that information out. I will talk a little bit about what we're gonna call the Ranch Innovation Center and a Feedlot Innovation Center. And another person once, a couple of years ago, I heard him talking about innovation and I like their definition. This is their definition. That it's good, okay, first off, it's gotta be good, and it's gotta be different, okay? And that they, they thought that was their definition of innovation. And I think what we're gonna try and do is good stuff and differently than what we have in the past, 
So we think we're using the right term, but you know everybody wants to be innovative, and many people are not. I think we're going to try um, to be giving useful stuff out that's, that's different. What are examples of that? Our, our RAN scientists, our, our RAIN scientists, and our cow nutritionists are working on uh, more real-time monitoring of cows in these cow systems. Um, they talk about measuring the, the pasture quality from the office. That's possible, they think. Might be hard for return on investment, right? That's a debate. And I understand that it's a whole hard to agree, but it's also uh, making it help with some, some convenience and help decrease labor use. Um, let's skip that. One of the things they're doing is, is actually measuring heart rate in some of these studies, looking at energy expenditure. It's been a real useful research tool. Don't know if that'll be useful in a grant setting. They're doing some individual supplementation. There's some ways to do that nowadays where you can individually supplement those cows that need it. Now you can supplement the cow that has calves and not the cow that hasn't calved yet, as an example, using some of those feeding systems. Some of our rain scientists are using uh, different systems to try and monitor grazing distribution and how cows are, are performing in different pastures. This is why my file is so <coughs> excuse me, this is why my file is so big and hard to load. Because those little dots are cows running around that grazing field. The Feedlot Innovation Center, we're gonna build two commercial scale uh, 1,000 head finishing units. One is open lot and one is a slab and floor facility. And we want to build those here at the University of Nebraska because we, we think we've been a leader in the feedlot research space and we want to continue to be a leader. And to be honest, there's no other university system uh, in the world with a facility quite like this. The South Coast State system, which they call the Opportunity Farm, is the closest thing that's, that's to this in terms of a commercial scale facility. So when we build that facility, we'll have the two environments. The other thing that we're going to do is this is going to be built fairly close to campus at Lee, Nebraska, and um, get students experiences and uh, really experiences they can't get anywhere else, especially with some of those innovations. So this is our research facility. We're proposing to build it next to our 100 head, our 100 pen current feedlot program, but those 100 pens are small pens. We need to be 60 head pens. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna focus on precision management and technology. So again, we've got some ideas and some things that we're already testing that then we will bring to bear in the feedlot. Um, one of the ideas, and this has already been somewhat developed, and, and I think that if you're if anybody's running a feedlot, everybody knows you have the person who's managing bumps every morning and making beef coffee. I don't care how good they are, we're gonna develop a system that I think is close to, to do it better. You will not have to call feed someday, right? The computer will actually make the prediction. Um, and I think they'll do it better. But I think we'll test that first, right? We'll, so we'll put the person in the computer. Um, another idea, which has not been developed yet anywhere, is uh, robotic pen scraping. Is everybody, is everybody what's, the, what's the word, uh, uh, Lula? Is that what it is? The vacuums in the house, right? It's a robotic. I want to call it a Moomba, but there's already that's been taken. There's some boat operation that's called Moomba. So something that's a Roomba, but for your open feedback pen, where you never have to go and scrape pens again. Um, that's going to happen, I think, because pen maintenance is a challenge. And by the way, it'll be a lot easier for that robotic cleaner to work than it will be for you to pull in your uh, your. Uh, Scraper or your, uh, what am I thinking of? Tell me. Fill holes. Box scraper, thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll have some innovations, we think, in this animal health space. I think that we're going to focus on manure management. I'm excited to have the slab and floor facility to do that. And then we're going to do some things that we've not traditionally done. Um, like look at novel things that have not been tested. What's the effect of the microbiome in these commercial feedlot systems? Antimicrobial resistance, nobody probably wants you to hear about that, but it's an issue for us that we're gonna have to tackle in the beef industry. Whether we want to or not, consumers are gonna demand it, so let's tackle it. And then if none of that works, we'll just fund it with what we traditionally do, which is what, I'm, what I focus on, and study more of the applied work that we want to do. 
We've hired a lot of people to do it. We're looking at some other innovations, like some partially covered tents, and then turning the old ones off. Anybody been to a baseball game or a football game with the closed stadium, but they have a retractable roof? We're actually gonna have some, hopefully some tents. This is high in the sky, but hopefully some tents will be there. So then on nice days, we'll open the tent up, and on bad days, we'll close it down. So just like I always do, Steve, I said I'll stop there, and then I did stop, so sorry about that. Is there any questions that we have to take? I know it's social time. Anything I can help with? If there's ever something I can help with, happy to do that. <laughs>